Well, welcome to Christian Answers. This is Pastor Jeff Short, your Bible teacher and cultural analyst. And today we're going to be looking at Gen Z, that is the younger people of today, this now generation. And there is a lot of talk about Gen Z in the media, a lot of talk about Gen Z in education, and especially on the job, a lot of criticisms of the way Gen Z operate and the way they work and their attitudes. And one of the attitudes that we see coming from Gen Z is a despair. It's sort of a nihilism. That is, they don't believe in anything. It's pointless. And so today I want to talk about a video that I found on the internet that explains a little bit about Gen Z and the attitudes of Gen Z. But in the context of this analysis of the current generation of young people, uh, there is some advice given by none other than Steve Jobs, the former Apple founder and president who is now deceased. But Steve Jobs has some advice, and some Gen Zers and also millennials are thinking that his advice is very profound. And I want to show that it's not actually profound at all, and that this kind of philosophy has been around for a long time, and it's not the correct way to look at life. It's not the correct path to go on even though someone as famous and as rich and as influential as Stephen Jobs of Apple had this advice. So this is not the advice to give to young people. The Word of God, but the Bible, God's Word, has given us everything we need to know to give to advice to Gen Z or the millennial generation or Generation X or the baby boomers or the post-war generation, or whoever you're talking about, God's Word is sufficient for everything we need in life because it is the revelation of God. So we need to turn to God and not to these philosophers and these homespun philosophies, even of famous people. So let me get into this video. I'm going to put my headphones on. We're going to get into an analysis video today, and let's uh, look at Gen Z and interact with this video that I'm bringing up here. This is called the Red Leather Podcast, and it talks a lot about the Generation Z and the trends in culture today. And so let me uh, roll this presentation, and I'll stop at certain points and make some comments on it. All right, boys, let's get the pressing. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right, so... We're not going to get super depressing here, but I've noticed this trend, right? If you want to call it that, um, of this life is pretty pointless videos. Um, they're popping up all over the place. This one's like, we're not depressed. We just see how meaningless life is and life is BS. And, you know, life is pointless. That's, this guy's actually really smart, I think. This dude, life is bullshit. It's like, take a hit already. This guy's this guy rich, though. Um <laughs> But you see all his life is meaningless. Um. Yeah, you have, this, uh, you have this deep, dark, depressing attitude of the current generation, and you have to ask yourself, okay, so why are the current young people, the Generation Z, why are they so depressed? Well, it's very easy to see why they're depressed. They are taught a godless, secular humanism in the public schools for hours and hours every day for years upon years, and they're indoctrinated in this godless, uh, naturalistic, materialistic worldview that is essentially atheistic. Let's just get right down to it. It's essentially atheistic. If you explain or try to explain all of existence without reference to God, then you're basically explaining and articulating atheism, right? Exactly. Um, if you try to explain all of human psychology, if you try to explain all of uh, material world, the natural world, the universe, the foundation of the planet Earth, and everything from a non-theological, non-spiritual standpoint, if you're trying to do that, you are attempting to basically outline an atheistic world where there is no God, there is no afterlife, there is no spiritual realm, there is no morality, there is no uh, anything that of the higher values that we've come to understand in the Western world. And if you do that to children and start them at a very early age in the public school system and run them through college, even college now, 
where they get even more heavy doses of secularism and atheism and agnosticism and criticism of all spirituality coming from Christianity and the Bible. If you expose kids to that for 20 years or so, then they are going to absorb that godless, atheistic, materialistic, immoral philosophy, and they're going to reflect it in their thinking. That's just common sense. And so that's what is happening with this current generation because, yeah, they have everything is meaningless and there's no point to life and they're looking around and they're asking questions, but their educational background in the public schools has not given them any answers. And then, of course, television and radio and movies and secular music, they're all orientated around man, humanistic, man-centered values and excluding God from any real practical concerns in their life. And then if you do that, of course, young people are going to think in terms of a man-centered, self-centered, materialistic, earthly advice. And they're going to look around and say, there's no point. There's no reason. Why should I get up in the morning and go to work? Why should I worry about the planet Earth? Why should I do this? Why should I do that? Because we're all going to die. And that's what you'll hear them say. Now, today's video, I'm going to focus on Stephen Jobs' uh, advice to people like the Gen Z and millennials. And we're going to focus on that. But then on the next video, I'm going to talk about, dig down into the actual pessimism and nihilism of Gen Z. So let's continue with the video clip. Um, and they seem to get a lot of views. But before we dive deep and get kind of like, because I know we've all been there, or at least I have. Um, but let's let Steve Jobs here, regardless of your thoughts on the guy, uh, I thought this was genius. Even if you've seen this clip, I think you should watch it again. Let's just let Steve do his thing here, and let's have some fun. Take a hit. <sighs> okay, so this guy is, I think he's a millennial, so he's not in the current young generation of Gen Z, but he has a lot of the ailments that they have also because he ran, he went through a public school system as most everyone else has, where the secular humanism worldview is the reigning philosophy of life. And so he's going to come at this from an atheistic, um, secular, materialistic viewpoint. And he finds Stephen Job and his philosophy appealing. Now, why would the younger generations find Stephen Jobs' philosophy of life appealing. Well, first of all, they're already preconditioned to really like Stephen Jobs because they're addicted to their smartphones. And, and Stephen Jobs is essentially the inventor of the modern smartphone. I think it was 2014, 2015, that the smartphone came into being, maybe, maybe a little bit earlier, 2012. But he is the one that essentially on the Apple stage at the Apple headquarters there out in California, he's the one that actually introduced the world to the iPhone. And that was the smartphone, the beginning of the smartphone generation. And so you had the millennial generation, like this guy here, uh, Morgan, his name is, Jack Morgan. And then you have the Generation Z that followed the millennials and they all have been grown up and addicted to their smartphones. This, These two generations, the Gen Z, the current generation, and the millennials that were before them, if you go into a crowd of Gen Z and millennials, you will find that most of the people, if they're waiting for something, are staring at their smartphones. And what's even stranger, if you go on the internet and you look at, for example, this, these two generations, Gen Z and, and, and millennials, if they get stopped by the police or they're arrested or they're detained by any kind of authority like the police, what will they be doing all the while that the officer is trying to talk to them? They'll be staring at their smartphone and clinging to their smartphone as if it is their salvation. So these generations, the younger generations, have been raised on the internet and they've been raised on smartphones and they can't go anywhere without them and it's their crutch. It's sort of like in the Lucy and Linus and the Charlie Brown cartoons, you had Linus 
and he had his security blanket and he drug it everywhere he went and it was smelly and dirty and everyone thought it was disgusting that here was this Linus character dragging his security blanket around with him. Well, that's Gen Z and the millennials. They have to have their smartphone everywhere they go. And the father of the smartphone here is Stephen Jobs. And so they look up to him as almost like a god. Uh, They reverent his words as if speaking as a prophet. And so that's the explanation why Stephen Jobs is so popular and his little sayings and quotes are so popular with the younger generations because he is essentially one of the prophets of the modern world. And when he speaks, they listen and they give him a lot of authority. And when we get into this video clip as to what he's actually saying, um, you, you wonder why he is listened to so much uh, other other than just he's famous and he was the inventor of the smartphone and Gen Z and millennials reverenced him for that, his content is really shallow. And I'll explain that as we go further in this clip. Seriously. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun. Save- okay, he's talking about social conformity. He's talking about as a member of a group, as a member of a society, as a member of a nation and a culture. Uh, and this has happened from history on you have you're born into the world and you don't know anything in the world so you have to listen to your parents you have to pretty much follow what they're saying they're the ones that give you the first instructions in your life and then when you get out into the wider society you have to learn the ways of how to live in social context with other people and so one of the the best ways uh, that has been handed down is that you uh you conform uh, more or less to the social conventions that have been given you uh, in order so that you're not antisocial. I mean, if, if you don't want to conform to the social conventions, then you're going to probably be breaking laws. You're going to be breaking social norms. You're going to be, uh, as a result, you're going to be an outcast. And in ancient times, that was basically the kiss of death because if you weren't in community and you didn't have any partnership an alliance with other human beings, you were just out there in the forest in, or in the desert or alone out there against the beasts and the weather and the climate, and you were probably not going to survive very long. So people figured out, hey, we got to stay together in society. And to do that, you have to basically buy into the basic norms and laws of society or else you will uh, be an outcast again and you'll, be, you'll perish. So there's nothing wrong with that. Now, what he wants to go further than that and say, well, that just, all that is, is just social convention. Everything is just social convention. Um, All thinking is social convention. All morality is social convention. All religion is social convention. Everything is simply invented by humans. That's what he wants to say. And that's taking the basic understanding of what a society is and how you have to live in society and taking it to an extreme. And it looks like Gen Z and millennials and the younger generation, they're buying right into that. So let me let him explain this further. A little money, um, but life, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. That's not true. That is a false statement. So, in other words, he's taking the simple, basic understanding of society, which is conforming to a set of rules, and many of them are made up by human beings, such as the local laws uh, about, for example, in the Wild West, uh, stealing one's horse was sometimes a capital offense. Why was that? Because in the ancient time, well, not ancient times, but in former times in the West, say in the United States, the wild, wild West, you you had to have that horse to get into town from where you lived in the country. You had to have that horse um, 
whether it was a workhorse or a mule or a donkey or whatever it was that you needed that for the farm to plow the fields, to haul supplies back and forth from the city. You needed that horse. And if somebody stole that, that was a major, major problem. And that's why, for example, in the wild, wild west out in Arizona and Colorado, Nevada, and many other states, uh, horse thieves were hung. It was a capital offense. That is more of a local adaptation of the law. It's a social convention. Now, in the East, where horses were not as necessity and as essential, um, then it wasn't as severe a penalty for stealing a horse. There were still consequences for thieves to steal anything, actually, but uh, it wasn't as bad as out in the West. So that's a social adaptation of the law against stealing. But the law against stealing is a universal basic moral code. And it's not invented by any man or it wasn't invented by people. Uh, it was something that was commanded by God that we are to adhere to. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not murder. You can't kill someone. These are foundational moral principles that are given by God, uh, whether through the written law, the law of Moses given on the Ten Commandments uh, and passed down to us through the Bible, or whether they are found in your own conscience with your own moral compass where you say, hey, I know that it's wrong to murder someone just because I don't like them or just because they stand in the way from what I want to do in life. So I can't just go up and murder someone or kill someone just because I want to. That is a moral instinct within us that God built within us because we are all made in the image of God. The Bible teaches us in Genesis, uh, God created them male and female in his image. He created them. So we have that uh, image of God inside of us telling us that murder is wrong. And we also have the actual command of God through prophetic revelation, for example, Moses on the Ten Commandments, uh, coming down from Mount Sinai, giving them to the people. So you have, this is divine moral command. Uh, it is not something that is made up by men. Um, the things that are made up by men consist of your local laws, uh, your local uh, fashions, for example, what is appropriate for public wearing in public. You can't walk around naked in public. Yeah, that's that was something that societies have different degrees of appropriateness. If you're on a beach, for example, and you're swimming, uh, there's more lenience as to how little clothes you can wear. If you're at a wedding, you're expected to dress in formal wear. Okay, yeah, these are all conventions that were made up by men, and those are negotiable, and those are flexible. And for example, the speed limits, you know, those are things that men set. Uh, I remember a while back, many years ago, decades ago, they used to have a radically low speed of 55 was the maximum speed for a long time, and you couldn't, by law, go over 55. And then they began to realize this is really silly because these cars are made to go uh, 80, 90 miles an hour. So they raised it up to 65 and then 70 some places and then even higher in some areas, 75. So you can, these are all the negotiable aspects of society. But Stephen Jobs is trying to say it's all negotiable. That the great secret of life is finding out that everything that you see and experience in life, that was all created, he says, by people who are no smarter than you. Well, no, that's incorrect, because there are rock-solid realities that we didn't create. Uh, we didn't create the law of gravity. It's not something that someone invented and then got everyone brainwashed into thinking that if you jump off a 10-story building in New York City, uh, you can live if you don't buy into the idea that you will die 
if you fall from a 10-story building. No, that's not a socially constructed concept. That is a law of reality. That is a that is a biological and material reality, and you have to conform to it. Um, there are spiritual laws, uh, just like you know the old Campus Crusade tract says the four spiritual laws. There are spiritual laws. If you sin against God, you will be punished on Judgment Day unless you uh, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it wasn't invented by anyone. That plan of salvation was not invented by anyone on this earth or any men or committee or group of men. It was handed down from God through Jesus Christ that if you look upon Jesus Christ, you will be saved. So there are realities that cannot be molded and then there are things that can be shaped. And jo- Stephen Jobs is saying that everything can be shaped and molded because everything is a social construct, and that is just plain false. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side. That you can- Okay, so he, right now, he's referencing, I think he's referencing the movie The Matrix, which came out, I think, in the 1990s, the late 1990s, mid-1990s, where it basically shows that you can create your own kind of a universe uh, through computer simulation by plugging your mind into a massive computer. And yeah, you can rewrite the code, so to speak, of reality, and you can do what they did in The Matrix uh, with Neo, who's the hero in that movie. You can jump off buildings and not die. You can jump o- jump across building to building because you're rewriting code, basically, and you're shaping reality. And this is also a Far Eastern philosophy. I think Hinduism and Buddhism, to some extent, uh, buy into the idea that Reality isn't what we think it is. It's basically a creation of our minds. And if we change our thinking and change our mental attitude or our mind, uh, we can alter reality. And you get some of that new age guru um, teaching also from other people in society. So there is that idea that uh, reality is moldable, it's shapeable, and you can change it. Well, yeah, in a sense, again, in a, in, a, in a limited sense, yes, uh, there are social constructs. There's no question about that, but not in the radical sense that Stephen Job is saying. That is a false philosophy. You cannot mold everything. You cannot shape everything. There is raw reality that God created in the beginning. God created the heavens and earth. God has set the boundaries of what is changeable, and if you go into life thinking that you can alter everything and it's just a matter of your own will or your own cleverness, then you are going to run into the problem of this. It won't change because you are not God and you can't create ex nihilo or out of nothing like God does in the opening chapters of Genesis. You have to conform to his reality. You have to conform to the reality of God and that's what wisdom teaches And that's why we're so lacking in wisdom today in our populations around the world, in the modern world, is because we're not listening to God. We're listening to men like Stephen Jobs, who have a little bit of it right. There are things you can change, but not everything like he's saying. You can change it. You can mold it. Um, That's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this... uh, this, uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it change it improve it make your mark upon it um well yeah i mean we should improve the things what is the old um, alcoholics anonymous aa uh, motto uh, prayer lord give me the wisdom to change the things i can change to accept the things i can't change and the wisdom to know the difference yeah, that's a good that's a good motto, and um, that was invented, I think, by the founder. His name is Bill. Uh, was the founder of AA, 
and they say that every time they meet, when the Alcoholics Anonymous circles meet, uh, they say, Lord, give me the uh, ability to change the things that I can change and to accept the things I cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. That's, that's the truth. So if he had said that, that would have been true. But he's going into some of this more or less more new age guru mysticism where your mind can change matter and you can basically alter reality with just your own persistence and your own thinking. That is false. That is false. We need to be grounded in reality, not into uh, Hindu or Buddhist mysticism. I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Pretty right. pointless you want, videos. You want to change things for the better, and that's true. But you also want to know the difference between the things that you can change that are malleable and the difference between the things that are not changeable. Uh, for example, we learn in the Bible, the scriptures, God's word, that we're all sinful and separated from God. Okay, nothing can change that, but we can receive Christ, we can receive his forgiveness, we can be forgiven of our sins, and we won't have to face God the Father on Judgment Day. So there are things we can change, but there are things we can't change, and we have to find out from God what to do about the things we can't change. And the only way sin can be dealt with properly is through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a philosophy, and we even saw this in the late President John F. Kennedy. He once said, anything that man has done can be undone or any problems that man has created, man can solve. Again, that is a false philosophy, because sin, for example, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they fell into sin. That was a problem they created for themselves in disobeying God. Now, they could not sol solve that so problem. They could not come up with a solution on their own. Um, they created a problem, man created a problem, but he now doesn't have a does not have the ability to solve it. So what all generations need, Gen Z, Millennial, Baby Boomers, Generation X, all of them need to realize is that God's reality is fixed. And the best we can do is go to God and say, God, help me deal with this reality, and you help me solve my problems. And we turn to God humbly in faith. We confess our sins, we apologize and ask God for forgiveness, and then he forgives us, but we need God in the equation. We cannot do this alone. We cannot solve our own problems. And so Stephen Jobs' advice is misleading in the sense that it's trying to tell people you can solve your own problems. You just have to realize that all these problems were created by people just like you, and you can find the solutions to all these problems in our world if we try hard enough. False. That's wrong. We need God and God Almighty to do it. We can't do it ourselves. So hope that's been helpful, and we'll see you back next week on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless. Mm -hmm.